All righty, folks. So big win for Donald Trump at the Supreme Court today. The Supreme Court rules nine to nothing unanimous court. that You can't just toss Donald Trump off a ballot for the presidency of the United States in a state like Colorado. You will recall that just a couple of months ago, the Supreme Court in Colorado decided that it was perfectly acceptable to invalidate Donald Trump on the ballot in Colorado in the primaries and the general because he was, quote unquote, an insurrectionist. The basic premise of their argument was really stupid. It was that because the Constitution of the United States bars from office insurrectionists, this means that the state government of Colorado can simply declare Trump an insurrectionist and then toss him off the ballot. That had a bunch of legal problems with it. Problem number one, how do you define insurrectionist? Problem number two, even if you were going to define insurrectionist, that would theoretically have to be done at the federal level, not the state level, because it's a federal piece of legislation. Problem number three, how do you even define it in terms of which party defines it in the federal government? Is that done by some sort of elections board? Is it done by the legislature? How does it distinguish itself, the insurrectionist clause, from, say, issues with age? Because the state could theoretically throw someone off the ballot if they were not, say, 35 years old and running for president. They could say, this person is not eligible. They don't get listed on the ballot. But that would be pretty obvious from the federal language. That person's not allowed. Insurrectionist is a vague term of art. Bottom line is, the court rules 9 nothing in favor of Donald Trump. He has to be put back on the ballot in Colorado. There is some minor controversy between the justices over exactly how in the future these sorts of issues are going to be adjudicated. But again, the big takeaway is that 9 nothing, including all the Democratic appointed justices, they say the Colorado State Supreme Court cannot simply declare that Donald Trump is an insurrectionist and therefore he can't be on the ballot. According to the court, proposed by Congress in 1866 and ratified by the states in 1868, the 14th Amendment, which is the, the section of the Constitution that has the insurrectionist clause, expanded federal power at the expense of state autonomy and thus fundamentally altered the balance of state and federal power struck by the Constitution. Section three of the amendment restricts state autonomy, but through a different means. It was designed to help ensure an enduring union by preventing former Confederates from returning to power in the aftermath of the Civil War. Section three works by imposing on certain individuals a preventive and severe penalty, disqualification from holding a wide array of offices rather than by granting rights to all. It's therefore necessary, as Chief Justice Chase concluded in the Colorado itself, Supreme Court itself recognized to ascertain what particular individuals are embraced by the provision. The Constitution empowers Congress to prescribe how those determinations should be made. So they say that under Section 5 of the 14th Amendment to the Constitution, it should be Congress defining who is an insurrectionist and who is not. They say Congress's Section 5 power is critical when it comes to Section 3. The case raises the question of whether states, in addition to Congress, can also enforce Section 3. We conclude states may disqualify persons holding or attempting to hold state office, but states have no power under the Constitution to enforce Section 3 with respect to federal officials, especially the presidency. So the court is making two separate arguments. Argument number one is that only Congress can define the word insurrectionist for purposes of who gets on the ballot and who does not. Argument number two is that even if that were not the case, the states do not have the ability to do that. So theoretically, you could have a different part of the federal government that actually created an enforcement mechanism that wasn't the legislature. But states don't have any power to enforce Section 3 with regard to federal offices, especially the presidency. According to the court, power over governance does not extend to federal office holders and candidates. Because federal officers owe their entire existence and function to the united voice of the whole, not a portion of the people, power over their election and qualifications must be specially delegated to rather than reserved by the states. So again, pretty easy, obvious opinion. Now, that doesn't mean there's not any controversy with regard to the opinion. So basically, again, there were two arguments that were made. The argument that's made about that it can only be Congress that determines who's an insurrectionist and who is not, that argument was not 9-0. The second argument that was made, which is that states cannot simply toss people out for federal office because that's the federal government's job. That particular argument they agreed with. As the court says, all nine members of the court agree with the result. Our colleagues writing separately further agree with many of the reasons this opinion provides for reaching it. So far as we can tell, they object only to our taking into account the distinctive way Section 3 works and the fact that Section 5 vests in Congress the power to enforce it. Okay, so this leads to a concurrence with, with a slight dissent on sort of the rationale from the liberal justices, Sotomayor, Kagan, and Jackson. And this entire opinion is written specifically to create sort of a side show of controversy. Because again, this is 9-0, meaning there really is no controversy. Everyone agrees. Colorado can't just toss Trump off the ballot. Illinois can't just toss, toss Trump off the ballot. Michigan, the same. So the minority opinion here, concurring in judgment, tries to find 
a point of differentiation from the majority opinion, specifically so they can say that the majority opinion is overreaching in favor of Trump. And that's actually what they say, right? They actually try to go out of their way to say this. So the dissenters, Sotomayor, Kagan, and Justice Jackson, again, they concur, but they're dissenting on this one part of the opinion. They say that allowing Colorado to simply declare who can and can't be on the ballot would violate the Constitution of the United States. But they say, quote, the majority goes further, even though all nine members of the court agree this independent and sufficient rationale resolves the case. Five justices go on. They decide novel constitutional questions to insulate this court and petitioner from future controversy. Although only an individual state action is at issue here, the majority opines on which federal actors can enforce Section 3 and how they must do so. The majority announces that a disqualification for insurrection can only occur when Congress enacts a particular kind of legislation pursuant to Section 5 of the 14th Amendment. And here's the key part. They say, quote, in doing so, the majority shuts the door on other potential means of federal enforcement. We cannot join an opinion that decides momentous and difficult issues unnecessarily, and we therefore concur only in the judgment. So what, I don't even understand their alternative theory of who exactly would decide it. They say the court opines on how federal enforcement of Section 3 must proceed. Congress, the majority says, must enact legislation under Section 5 prescribing procedures to ascertain what particular individuals should be disqualified. These musings are inadequately supported as they are gratuitous. Again, they don't actually offer an alternative theory as to exactly how somebody would be disqualified. But the bottom line is, that they say that they're going out of their way to basically rip the majority on the court, even though they agree with the majority on the court. They say, quote, Section 3 serves an important, though rarely needed role in our democracy. The American people have the power to vote for and elect candidates for national office. That is a great and glorious thing. The men who drafted and ratified the 14th Amendment had witnessed an insurrection and rebellion to defend slavery. They wanted to ensure that those who had participated in that insurrection and in possible future insurrections could not return to prominent roles. Today, the majority goes beyond the necessities of this case to limit how Section 3 can bar an oath-breaking insurrectionist from becoming president. Although we agree that Colorado cannot enforce Section 3, we protest the majority's effort to use this case to define the limits of federal enforcement of that provision. So we concur only in the judgment. They say the court, quote, reaches out to decide Section 3 questions not before us, and to foreclose future efforts to disqualify a presidential candidate under that provision. And basically, what they're saying is they did this for Trump. Now, what's weird is that they're, they're claiming that the Supreme Court majority went beyond its remit in order to help Trump, presumably because they think that if, say, Congress were run by Democrats, a simple piece of legislation not defining insurrection, but just saying Donald Trump cannot run because he is an insurrectionist might be sufficient. Which, yeah, again, very, very doubtful that that's the case. Bottom line, though, in the end, is what Amy Coney Barrett says. She says, this is 9-0. We're done here. Big win for Donald Trump. Again, the attempt to bar Trump from the ballot failing only helps Trump. And again, that's not the only factor Trump has going for him. The polling data that came out over the course of the last three days is devastating for Joe Biden's campaign. We'll get to more on this in just one second. First, does it make sense that a single company controls 90% of all internet searches, runs your email service, and gets to track everything you do on your smartphone? Big tech is more powerful than most countries. And they profit by exploiting your personal data. It's time to put a layer of protection between you and your online activity and the people who exploit that online activity. That's why I use ExpressVPN. Think about how much of your life is on the internet. Sadly, every site you visit, video you watch, or message you send gets tracked and data mined. But when you run ExpressVPN on your device, their software hides your IP address. This is something big tech can use to personally identify you. So ExpressVPN makes your activity harder to trace and sell to advertisers. ExpressVPN also encrypts 100% of your internet data to keep you safe from hackers and eavesdroppers on your network. ExpressVPN does all of that without slowing your connection. What I like most about ExpressVPN, it's really easy to use. Download that app on your computer or phone, tap one button, you are now protected. So stop handing over your personal data to the big tech monopoly that mines your activity and sells your information. Protect yourself with the VPN I trust to keep me safe online. Visit expressvpn.com slash Ben. That's E-X-P-R-E-S-S-V-P-N.com slash Ben. Get three extra months for free. Go to expressvpn.com slash Ben right now to learn more. So Joe Biden is in serious, serious trouble. We say this often, but the reality is that Joe Biden has not led in the polls against Donald Trump for one third of a year. Okay, the fact is that Donald Trump is the leader in the clubhouse right now. If the election were held today, he wouldn't just win. He would win by a fairly large electoral margin. He would win about 293 electoral votes if the election were held today and maybe more given the trend lines in this particular election. The latest evidence comes courtesy of a horrific poll for Joe Biden from The New York Times, Siena. It came out over the weekend and it is just awful for Joe Biden. This poll shows that Donald Trump is beating Joe Biden 48 to 43. 
But it's not really just the result of the poll, the top line result of the poll that's a problem for Joe Biden. It is all the cross tabs. The cross tabs are a disaster for Joe Biden. Cross tabs are the demographic breakdowns by group for the candidates. So under this rubric, the New York Times Siena poll rubric, by race, Donald Trump in this poll wins Hispanics outright, 46 to 40. Let's just be clear about this. Donald Trump, the guy who once tweeted out that he loves Mexicans because tacos, is beating Joe Biden 46 to 40 in this poll. The guy who the entire media suggested would never be president because he said that Mexican rapists were crossing. That guy is winning Hispanics 46 to 40, which again demonstrates Hispanic. Not a great catch-all category, not a great catch-all term. It actually encompasses a wide variety of people from a wide variety of backgrounds and countries. He is winning them outright, 46 to 40. But that's not the only shocking crosstab in this poll. Among black voters, Joe Biden is winning just 66% versus 23% for Donald Trump. 66% is the number to note there. 23% is it. If any Republican wins 23% of the black vote in a presidential race, that Republican will be president of the United States. But 66% for Joe Biden is a full-scale disaster area. You win two-thirds of the black vote and you're a Democrat, you are toast in a presidential race. Now, again, these cross tabs, you have to take them with a certain grain of salt. They have huge margins of error, up to 10 points margins of error for some of these cross tabs. Because, again, when you do a poll, the accuracy of the poll depends on the number of people that you poll. The larger, generally, the poll sample size, the more accurate the poll. When you're looking at a poll like this one, where you might have 90 people who are Hispanic responding, there's a lot of margin for error. However. If this poll is even remotely close, Joe Biden is basically toast at this point. Donald Trump is winning white voters outright 53 to 40. In terms of age demographic, this is kind of a shocking one. Joe Biden is winning people 65 and over, which is kind of surprising because very often the older votes tend to skew Republican. But in this particular poll and in this election cycle, voters aged 30 to 64 broadly favor Donald Trump over Joe Biden in this election, particularly people aged 45 to 64. In other words, the people who are just above the millennials, the sort of Gen X people, those people are voting 54 to 36 for Donald Trump, according to this poll. Women are split evenly between Biden and Trump. There's not one good piece of data for Joe Biden in this poll. And the most important thing about this poll is that what it does not show is that Joe Biden is wildly unpopular among Democrats, for example. He shows there's a, it shows there's a lack of enthusiasm for Joe Biden among Democratic base voters. They're not quite as enthused to vote as Republican base voters would be. The real problem for Joe Biden is not with his base. This is what I've been saying. The real problem for Joe Biden is not with the Hamasniks in Dearborn, Michigan. The real problem for Joe Biden is not with radical BLM types inside the Democratic Party. The problem for Joe Biden is that he governed as a radical Bernie Sanders type. He got into office and he decided he was going to govern far to the left instead of entering with the coalition that brought him and then dancing with them. He decided to jettison the entire center of the political spectrum. And Donald Trump is gradually taking over the center of the political spectrum, as we discussed last week on the show. You cannot name a position in modern American politics where Joe Biden now occupies the center and Donald Trump occupies the periphery. It's virtually always the other way around, including mainstream Democrat issues like abortion. It is Joe Biden who is saying things like abortion up until birth. And it is Donald Trump who's not saying we ban abortion all the way from inception and conception. He says we should ban abortion federally, maybe at 16 weeks, which is a pretty broad consensus position in the American populace. Joe Biden has abandoned the moderates. Joe Biden has lost the moderates. How do you win those people back? Seriously, how do you do it? I think it's too late for him. This is a disaster area for Nate Silver points this out. Nate Silver Excellent poll analyst who, again, has fallen out of grace with a bunch of left wingers because he suggested Hillary Clinton was likely to win the 2016 election and then she didn't. And then they got mad at the messenger. Then, then because Nate Silver tried to explain why that had happened, they got very angry at him. And to more on this in just one moment. First, nobody likes to talk about life insurance. It's really dark, right? But here's the thing. You need to do it. Start shopping right now with Policy Genius. Find the right policy to protect your family today. Give yourself the peace of mind that comes with knowing that if, God forbid, something were to happen to you, your family can cover their expenses while they get back on their feet. Policy Genius's technology makes comparing life insurance quotes from America's top insurers easy. Just a few clicks. You already have life insurance policy through work, but it might not offer enough protection for your family's needs. And if you switch jobs, 
it's basically gone. You need a backup plan. With Policy Genius, you can find life insurance policies starting at just 292 bucks per year for a million dollars in coverage. Some options offer same-day approval and avoid those unnecessary medical exams. Policy Genius has licensed agents who can help you find the best fit for your needs. When they make it this easy, there really is no excuse not to do it. Policy Genius works for you, not the insurance companies, which means they're not incentivized to recommend one insurer over another so you can actually trust their guidance. Save time, money, provide your family with financial safety net using Policy Genius. Head on over to policygenius.com slash Shapiro or click that link in the description. Get your free life insurance quote. See how much you could save. That's policygenius.com slash Shapiro. So Nate Silver has a great piece over at his website, natesilver.net, in which he breaks down the problem in these polls for Joe Biden. He says Democrats usually assume they win elections through turnout rather than persuasion. It's not a crazy proportion by any means, but it looks like a losing approach for 2024. For most of recent history, more Americans identified as Democrats than Republicans. That obviously didn't translate into Democratic victories 100% of the time. Until relatively recently, Democrats did better among non-college voters than among college graduates. Many Democrats are also racial minorities who face steeper barriers to voting, et cetera, et cetera. But he says that typically speaking, this has been the Democratic strategy, particularly since 2012. I've pointed this out before. Democrats fell in love in 2012 with the Barack Obama theory. We don't need to go after the median voter. The median voter can be safely abandoned. All we need is our coalition of the oppressed and some college-educated white liberal ladies. That's all we need. Nate Silver points that out. He said Mitt Romney in the 2012 election actually won independent voters, but because Democrats had a bigger base with 38% of voters in the national exit identifying as Democrats compared to 32% Republicans, Barack Obama won comfortably. But as Nate Silver points out, Barack Obama's coalition cannot be updated for Joe Biden. Barack Obama was a charismatic figure. Barack Obama was the first black president. Joe Biden is an old white man who can't speak English anymore. And so what's actually happening with Joe Biden is that he, like Barack Obama in 2012, has given away the moderates. He's given them away. As Nate Silver points out, when it comes to independent voters, this is a great, it's a great thing to think about. If you are an independent voter and you switch your vote, let's say you voted Biden in 2020 and now you're voting for Trump, What you just did is actually worth twice what a base voter showing up did. A base voter showing up means that the base vote, let's say their marginal voter didn't vote in 2020, did vote in 2024. So let's say that you have 20 people who are voting and then a marginalized voter shows up and votes for you. So now you win 11 to 10. Okay, here's what happens if an independent voter who voted in 2020 switches. Let's say that it was split 10 to 10. That voter takes a vote away from one side and gives it to the other, creating a two-vote margin. Instead of it now being 11 to 10, it shifts to 11-9. So an independent voter is actually worth more in terms of margin of victory than just any person who is going to vote for the, the, the Democratic side and didn't show up in 2020. Ray right? says, the underlying arithmetic of how votes are tallied means that flipping a voter is worth twice as much as turning a non-voter out. Plus, the composition of the electorate has changed. Democrats have lost their edge on party ID in a lot of polls. This is what happened, by the way, in the state of Florida, which has now turned bright red. That's because Republicans did the -the on-the-ground work of going and registering Republican voters, which means that Democrats do not have a base turnout advantage in the state of Florida, plus independents tend to vote Republican in the state of Florida. So it shifted from a purple state to a very red state. So, as Nate Silver points out, in Gallup polling throughout 2023, the same percentage of Americans identify now as Democratic and Republican. 43% now ID ID as independent, which means independent voters should be more important to Joe Biden, but that's who he's forgotten about. So it's one thing to say, I'm going to appeal to the base when 38% of voters say they're Democrats and 32% say they're Republicans. It's a whole other thing when 27% of people say they are Republicans and 27% of people say they're Democrats and 43% say neither, which means they hate both candidates. So who's going to win those people? Now, as Nate Silver points out, the reality is, Donald Trump is winning those people going away. The poll from the New York Times Siena asked voters who they voted for in 2020 and then asked them who they plan to vote for in 2024. So bizarrely, the poll showed that the recalled vote, you know, people who said they voted in 2020, what they said was that they voted by Biden by a 12 point margin. Now, again, that demonstrates this is this is actually a Democrat heavy poll because the reality is that Joe Biden did not win by 12 points. Joe Biden won by 4.5 percentage points. But they say that they voted in 2020, this voting base, 53-41 for Joe Biden. Now, all those same voters asked, who are you going to vote for in 2024? Said Trump, 48 to 43, which means Biden lost 10 points off 
of the 2020 vote among these voters. And Donald Trump gained seven points, which makes sense, right? Not everybody who shifted from Biden loves Donald Trump, but most of them are willing to vote for Donald Trump. So what he says is that in the poll, only 83% of voters who say they chose Biden in 2020 plan to vote for him this year. 97% of those who voted for Trump plan to vote for Trump again. Those are swing voters, people who are willing to move from one party to the other. And there are many of them. And the point that Nate Silver makes is that for every 10 voters who are voting to Donald Trump, fewer than one are switching over to Joe Biden from the Trump camp. In other words, Donald Trump is winning independence right now. And that means that he is likely to win the election. This poll data, by the way, is supported by further polling over the weekend from both the Wall Street Journal and CBS News. According to a brand new CBS News poll, when asked how they would rate the presidencies of Donald Trump and Joe Biden, when they say Donald Trump, looking back, was it excellent or good or fair or poor? 46% say excellent or good. 53% say fair or poor about Donald Trump. Joe Biden so far, only 33% say excellent or good. 67% say fair or poor. When they look back on the economy, 65% of people polled in the CBS poll, which, by the way, shows Trump up 52-48 over Joe Biden. 65% say that Donald Trump's economy was good compared to 28% who say that it was bad in the CBS poll. Joe Biden, 38% say the economy is good, as opposed to 59% who say that the economy is bad. And again, a huge percentage of this is about inflation. 55% of registered voters say that Joe Biden's policies make the prices go up, as opposed to 34% who say that Donald Trump's policies created inflation, because obviously they didn't. Now, again, these are disaster numbers for Joe Biden. And issue by issue, it's almost impossible to see how Joe Biden wins this election under these circumstances. Most Democrats are disheartened about what's happening in this election cycle. By the way, so are most Republicans. It turns out that most people generally are not super happy about the candidates they have, but they are way unhappier with Joe Biden. Why? Because their, their hopes were disappointed. Joe Biden actually, I pointed this out many times, when Joe Biden came into office, his approval rating was in the mid-50s, close to 60%. He is now down in the 40s. When Donald Trump entered office, his approval rating was at like 48%. And when he left office, his approval rating was at like 43%. In other words, people didn't have high hopes for Trump. And then those hopes might have been mildly disappointed. I'm not talking about Republicans. I'm talking about the general voting base. Joe Biden came into office on the wings of eagles, and then he proceeded to drive the plane directly into the ground for himself. According to this CBS News poll, most of Biden's voters feel the election is mostly about stopping Trump. Most of Trump's voters say that they are voting Trump because they like him, not because they hate Joe Biden. So Democrats not in love with Joe Biden, many switching over to Trump. Disaster area for Joe Biden. Again, Wall Street Journal poll, same same data today. Trump up 47, 45. Voters are slightly more upbeat on the economy, but they don't credit it to Joe Biden. They're saying that this is happening in spite of Joe Biden. And underlying all of this, of course, is the simple fact that Joe Biden is just too old. Every poll shows a huge majority of people, including a huge majority of Democrats, think Joe Biden is no longer with us because he's not. And here's the thing. That ain't going to reverse itself. Get to more on this in just a moment. First, are you struggling with back taxes or unfiled returns this year? The IRS is making things worse. They've now escalated collections by adding 20,000 new agents. Well, in these tough times, your best defense is to use Tax Network USA. Along with hiring thousands of new agents and field officers, the IRS has kicked off 2024 by sending over 5 million pay-up letters to those who have unfiled tax returns or balances owed. These guys are not your friends. Don't waive your rights and speak with these agents independently without backup. Tax Network USA, a trusted tax relief firm, has saved over a billion dollars in back taxes for their clients. They can help you secure the best deal possible. Whether you owe 10 grand or 10 million bucks, they can help. Whether it's business or personal taxes, whether you have the means to pay or you're on a fixed income, Tax Network can help resolve your tax burdens once and for all. Seize control of your financial future right now. Do not let tax issues overpower you. Contact Tax Network USA for immediate relief and expert guidance. Call 1-800-245-6000 or visit TNUSA.com slash Shapiro. Turn to Tax Network USA. Find your path to financial peace of mind. That's TNUSA.com slash Shapiro. Joe Biden could reverse himself positionally. He could theoretically start to embrace moderation on the border. He could theoretically start to embrace moderation on spending. He could theoretically allow, for example, Israel to defeat Hamas and stand up against the Hamas next in his own party. He could do all of those things, and that might marginally change the trajectory of the race. But in the end, people tend to vote based on who they see in front of them. And what they see is a corpse. 
What they see in Joe Biden is an actual dead person. And it turns out that Americans in 2020, they were promised a staid, sober administration. The adults back in charge. And if the guy was slightly senile, okay. And it turns out he's just a crazy old man who rants at the moon and walks into walls while gruel falls out of his mouth. And that's not a great look. Because now they're being asked to choose between crazy on the one hand, which is how Americans perceive Donald Trump, and crazy and senile in Joe Biden. Because again, Joe Biden moved too far to the left. It was one thing to say, I'm a houseplant, right? This was his claim. He's a houseplant hiding the Democratic Party radical water stain. That's what he was there for. It's a big water stain right there on the carpet. Take President Houseplant, put him on the water stain. All your problems are solved. And then it turns out that the houseplant is leaky and it's making the water stain significantly bigger. And most Americans, particularly swing voters, do not like this at all. And all of that just reinforces feelings about his age. And he ain't getting younger. That's the one thing you can't reverse. I don't care how much crap you shoot into that guy. That dude is dead. And he, I mean, physically, he is no longer with us. And it's, it's the more you see of him, the worse it gets. And this is a big problem for Joe Biden. The more of Donald Trump you see, the more of Donald Trump you see. I've said this since 2015, 2016. Donald Trump is a mud monster. The more mud you throw at him, the more he just becomes full of mud. Joe Biden, every time he goes out, he hurts himself. Every time he's on camera, he and, and every time he's not on camera, he hurts himself because we know that he's hiding. You can play a basement strategy when you're not the president of the United States. And in fact, that's what Donald Trump should do in this campaign. Joe Biden cannot play the basement strategy. He's the current president of the United States. And so the guns are starting to open up even from the left on Joe Biden. So you can see it's every day, every single day. The Biden administration has to trot out people who are not Joe Biden to convince everybody that Bernie is alive, that the corpse is actually alive. And it's not working because first rule of politics, if you have to explain that you are not the thing, you're definitely the thing. So when you send out Alejandro Mayorkas to talk about how bright and with it you are behind closed doors, but then you walk out and you basically are stumbling around, bumbling around. Well, it makes your people look like both liars and, and also political hacks. Here's Alejandro Mayorkas being both. Obviously, this is art, but they do this because they try to make a point that there is a discussion in the zeitgeist. There is a reason that they did a whole thing about Joe Biden's age. Do you want to have a, a real a statement about it, about what you witness? Uh, they should um, spend a bit of time with Joe Biden like... I have done. Um, l- let me share something with you. Mm. I prepare a lot for meetings with him and engagements with him because he's remarkably detail oriented, probing and operationally focused. OK, that was on Sunday. OK, the prior night, Saturday Night Live did an entire opening skit about members of the Biden administration saying this stuff. And then they went out and confirmed it on Sunday by doing it. So here on Saturday Night Live is Saturday Night Live performing the rare feat of actually attacking a Democrat by pointing out that all of his administration officials, all of his allies, are out there claiming that he's totally with it when he totally is not. On Tuesday, President Joe Biden won the Michigan primary, but a New York Times poll today has him down five points, and many voters still have concerns about his age. Here with me is Governor of California and Biden advocate Gavin Newsom. Great to be with you, Dana. I understand people care about the president's age, but what they should care about is his record. Look at what Joe Biden has done for America. He's created more jobs than any president in history. Inflation is down. The Shamrock Shake is back. And Beyonce (laughs) has gone country. Thank you, Joe. We are now joined live by Secretary of Homeland Security, Alejandro Mayorkas. Thanks for having me, Dana. Uh, Man, I am exhausted. I was with Joe Biden for the past weekend, and phew! He wiped me out. (laughs) Okay, so you feel he's up to the job. Dana, I was just with him. And behind closed doors, he's a dynamo. This weekend, we both went down to the border town of Brownsville, Texas, and Joe went into beast mode. He said, we got to tighten this border. Look how easy I can cross it. Then he parkoured up to the top of the border wall. He front flipped into the Rio Grande and came back up with a fish in his mouth. (laughs) When SNL is going after a Democrat, you know that Democrat is in serious trouble. Bill Maher also going after Joe Biden because Bill will say the truth about Joe Biden, which is that he is no longer with us, the late lamented president of the United States. Instead of trying to refute all the too old to be president slams, Joe must embrace them. Stop with the I'm sharper than ever. Nobody's buying that. (laughs) Don't try to deny the age thing. Lean into it. Lean in. Lean in like you're eating soup. (laughs) 
And just admit it. Say, yes, I'm bad with names. And I walk like a toddler with a full diaper. <laughs> but I believe in democracy. Because Joe's problem is not a new one for Democrats. Not the age thing specifically. But the idea of letting the opposition intimidate you into being defensive about who you really are. Yes, that we've seen before. John Kerry pretending to be a duck hunter. <laughs> Hillary carrying hot sauce in her purse. <laughs> Americans hate that <laughs> Be yourself. And Joe, yourself is old. <laughs> That's who you are. <laughs> old. Okay, the problem with that is that no one wants that. So he's stuck between a rock and a hard place. I mean, Mara's giving him the best advice, which is you can't avoid it. So just, you know, embrace it. But the problem is no one wants that. And Joe's not just old. Joe is not with it. He stumbles out. He goes, and then a fire breaks out in the Middle East. He stumbles out. And suddenly there's a riot somewhere. And nobody wants that. No one. We'll get to more on this in just one second. First, when most people say that a product is free, uh, it doesn't actually mean free. But when you say free, it should mean that. No strings attached, no hidden costs, no fine print. When you switch to Pure Talk today, you'll get a free Samsung 5G smartphone. No four-line requirement, no activation fee, just that free Samsung that's built to last, rugged screen, quick charging battery, top-tier data security. Qualifying plans start at just 35 bucks monthly for unlimited talk, text, 15 gigs of data, and mobile hotspot. Pure Talk gives you phenomenal coverage on America's most dependable 5G network. It's the same coverage you know and love, but for half the price of the other guys. Pure Talk saves the average family almost $1,000 a year. Plus, with Pure Talk, you know you're spending your hard-earned money with a company that actually aligns with your values. Let Pure Talk's expert U.S. customer service team help you make that switch over today. Go to puretalk.com slash Shapiro. Claim eligibility for your free brand new Samsung 5G smartphone. Start saving on wireless today. Again, go to puretalk.com slash Shapiro. Switch to my cell phone company, puretalk.com slash Shapiro. So, Leftists are now in the middle of seething and coping. They have now, they're, they're now performing the Kathleen Kennedy strategy. Okay, we call it the Kathleen Kennedy strategy. So Kathleen Kennedy is the head of the Lucasfilm division over at Disney. So she's been in charge of the Star Wars franchise for the past decade or so. And she has taken the most prized IP in the history of American cinema and driven it directly into the ground because she's terrible at her job. So Kathleen Kennedy and the people at Disney have come up with a strategy. It's a strategy that's now being imitated all over Hollywood. And the strategy is this. Make a movie no one likes and then yell at the audience about how intolerant they are when the movie fails. So you make a movie like The Last Jedi and you make an absolutely interminably awful character like Rose. And then when the audience doesn't like the movie, you say, well, it's because you just don't like Asian people in Star Wars. That obviously has been a giant fail for Hollywood because it turns out that ripping the audience is a terrible way to get people to come see your movies. And actually, it doesn't, it doesn't win your friends, it doesn't win you, in my, and it doesn't make your movies better. And it also blinds you to the reality, which is that you need to course correct when it comes to your own movies. Because you end up just doubling down on stupid. If you keep blaming the audience over and over and over, then you're just going to keep making the same crappy movie 87 times in a row. And every time it fails, you're going to say, it's not me, it's the audience. Okay, well, Joe Biden is doing that right now, and his entire team is doing that right now. Democrats have decided that it's not Joe, it's you. This is a strategy for failure. And so the media was replete over the weekend with members of the left suggesting that the real problem is voting Americans. The real problem is the insane, insipidity, foolishness of the normal voting American. The normal voting American just doesn't get it. They're racist. They're sexist. They're terrible. They're threats to democracy. So, for example, MSNBC, which is the repository of this entire strategy, had on a University of Maryland political science professor named Thomas Schaller, who promptly explained that white rural voters are a, are a threat to democracy. Now, what a normal political party would do is say, why aren't we winning white rural voters? What are their concerns? Perhaps we should listen to those. And maybe we have some, maybe we don't. Maybe their agenda doesn't cross over with ours at all. And we're just going to forego their votes. That's what a normal political party would do. This Democratic Party has decided if white rural voters will not vote for Joe Biden, which, by the way, is the reason he was nominated. It's because the idea was he was going to cut into Donald Trump's white rural voting base. And by the way, he did. If you look, statistically speaking, Donald Trump actually underperformed in rural areas and overperformed in urban areas in 2020. So it actually worked for Joe Biden. Then he promptly abandoned those people. And now they're relegated to saying that all those people are racist, fascist Nazis out in the sticks. Why are white rural voters a threat to democracy at this point? You would think, as we pointed out, 
looking at Joe Biden's background and Donald Trump's that that the opposite would be true. I mean, we lay out the fourfold interconnected threat that white rural voters pose to the country. First of all, and we show 30 polls and national studies to demonstrate this. So we provide the receipts in Chapter 6. They're the most racist, xenophobic, anti-immigrant, and anti-gay geodemographic group in the country. Second, they're the most conspiracist group. QAnon support and subscribers, election denialism, COVID denialism and scientific skepticism, Obama birtherism. Third, anti-democratic sentiments. They don't believe in an independent press, free speech. They're most likely to say the president should be able to act unilaterally without any checks from Congress or the courts or the bureaucracy. They're also the most strongly white nationalist and white Christian nationalist. And fourth, they are most likely to excuse or justify violence as an acceptable alternative to peaceful public discourse. So- they're all Nazis. Okay, so, the, so again, if you actually were to look at the data on this, what you would see is that the data tends to suggest that a fairly small minority of people actually believe all the things that this person just said. He says they're the most likely subgroup in the United States to believe this. It doesn't mean the vast majority of white rural voters are all Nazis. But even if that were true, the reality is that if you want to win an election, presumably you are going to have to figure out some common, like if you just yell at them, you're not going to win their votes. Pretty obviously. And again, this is so bizarre because Bill Clinton's entire pitch in 1992 and 1996 is that he was going to win those voters. That also happened in the pitch of, for example, Howard Dean in 2004. And then it was the pitch, once again, of actually Barack Obama in 2008. He went after a lot of those voters. But Democrats have decided that since 2012, they're just going to abandon that voting base. And then if they lose, they're just going to call everyone they disagree with Nazis, which, of course, reinforces the entire reactionary swing the country is experiencing right now. Baya Unger Sargon, who is not a member of the right wing. I know Baya, very nice person. Baya is also a good political analyst from the left, and she was on Bill Maher, and they were talking about this. And she says the problem for Joe Biden is not that he is losing his base. This is what the stats show. The problem is that working class voters do not like him. They feel he has abandoned them. And when you just rip into voters, it turns out they don't like you very much. Should Democrats be worried about the 100,000 uncommitted votes in the Michigan primary? Oh, yes, I read about this. Will protest votes over Biden's policy in Gaza cost him the election in the fall? What are your thoughts? Um, I think that the media really, really wants to put this narrative out there that Biden is going to lose Michigan over Gaza when the truth is he's going to lose Michigan over 600,000 auto workers because his EV market was extremely punishing to auto workers. And like we said earlier, there's been this big realignment where working class Americans are very, very, very much on the Trump train, people who used to be Democrats and used to vote for Democrats. And rather than admit that, this outrage that Democrats lost the working class vote and try to figure out how we can appeal to them again, um, they're looking for excuses and other things to blame, like, oh, this war in Gaza, or they'll call them deplorables, or they'll call them racists, you know, because they don't want to admit that Trump has picked up a lot of the policies that used to be Democratic policies in the 90s, like controlling the border, for example. The idea that an open border and mass migration is extremely punishing to the working class. It drives down their wages. It's class warfare against the working class. It is an upward transfer of wealth from the working class who end up competing with immigrants to the elites who end up employing them. And now they can employ cheap immigrants instead of having to pay working class Americans a living wage. She's totally right. She's totally right. And Democrats used to own that crowd. And now they've given up that crowd. Again, what the polls are showing is that Joe Biden, the entire middle of the country, what we are watching, what what this election could be. I mean, not guaranteed. It's still very early. You could be watching a political realignment in real time. Again, Democrats thought that they were going to be able to unify an entirely minority base with some white college educated ladies. That was the 2012 base. And they were just going to replicate it over and over. The dirty secret of 2020 is that Joe Biden actually carved into some of the blue collar base that Donald Trump owned in 2016. In 2024, he's going to lose all those people. Not only is he going to lose all those people, it turns out that, believe it or not, demographics is not necessarily destiny. It turns out that Hispanic voters may, in fact, turn out in larger numbers than certainly usual for Donald Trump. He won 30 to 35 percent of that vote in the last couple election cycles. He could win 40 to 45 percent in this election cycle. If you get 20 percent of the black vote, that is double what any Republican has received for generations. That could happen, too. You could be watching an actual realignment not caused again by Donald Trump, a realignment caused by the failures of Joe Biden because he decided that he was going to be a historic president and his ego overtook him. His ego made him think he was going to be LBJ or FDR. 
But the dirty secret about LBJ and FDR is they had the white working class on their side. You know who the Democrats currently do not have? Because they've separated them off from the priorities of their party, the white working class. It's a real problem for them, and it's not going to stop. And everybody who's looking at the economy can see this happening. For example, fascinating article in the UK Daily Mail today says taxpayer funded guaranteed income programs that hand struggling families up to $36,000 with no strings attached are being rolled out across the country. According to the UK Daily Mail, the schemes whose total value exceeds $125 million have surged in popularity since the pandemic as progressive leaders embrace cash handouts to support Americans below the poverty line. But the radical projects have been criticized after it emerged that one mother of three in Washington, D.C. spent more than half of a $10,800 lump sum payment on a luxury holiday to Miami, along with a new wardrobe for her kids and a glow up for herself. This sort of stuff is quite reminiscent of the sort of welfare queen rhetoric of the 1980s. You could be watching the remaking of the Reagan coalition in real time because Democrats are terrible at this. Meanwhile, Joe Biden is racking up debt at such an exorbitant pace at this point that there is no way out but through. The American government is going to have to do two things simultaneously. One, cut spending and figure out what the hell to do with entitlements. And two, grow the economy like gangbusters. Nobody believes that Joe Biden is going to do either of those things. And so what you're looking at is the possibility of a fairly serious long-term secular stagnation. Secular just meaning across the entire economy, not in any one industry. A secular stagnation. According to a Wharton professor named Hao Gomez, he says, that the $34 trillion debt burden of the United States could upset the world's financial markets as early as next year, especially if a president-elect announces a raft of expensive policies. Well, you know that that's exactly what Joe Biden is going to do. He keeps saying it over and over, that he wants more expensive policies, which, of course, would make it difficult for America to raise more debt. Meanwhile, the Biden administration is pursuing the world's worst immigration policies. What Batya said right there about the fact that you are now having a Democratic Party that is importing cheap labor in order to help business allies, that is 100% true. That is obviously the case. The Democratic Party has to prop up the inflationary economy with deflationary wages. That's the only way you get to deflation. The way you get to deflation is by lowering the wage burden. So Democrats have a real problem. If they want an inflationary economy, they need unions, right? This is what they, if you want, if you, if you want union power that inflates wages artificially, and the Biden administration works with the unions, but at the same time, you can't let the unions dominate the labor base because if they do, it's going to inflate the currency. So what do you have to do? You actually have to bring in a sub-wage labor base. You have to bring them in and have them work illegally. So at the same time that you're pushing the unions who are your political allies so they can make their money and then spend that money on you getting elected, you have to bring in a labor base that's actually going to lower prices for the vast majority of American consumers, which is what cheap labor does from illegal immigration. The problem is that Americans can see what's happening in real time and they do not like it. By the way, this is amazing. The Biden administration is now starting to openly admit how many people they brought into the country. According to Axios, more than 8 million asylum seekers and other migrants will be living inside the United States in legal limbo by the end of September. That is a 167% increase in five years alone. That's insane. There are only 3 million people who are living inside the United States in legal limbo who had not had a hearing or whatever. As of 2019, it is now up to 8 million. The backlog has absolutely exploded under Joe Biden. And that is not just because we don't have enough funding for the border courts. It is because Joe Biden has opened the border wide and given everybody a date certain to come back by and no one shows up again. And as the Wall Street Journal points out, businesses are relying more on migrant workers as labor shortages persist. According to the Wall Street Journal, Dependence on imported workers is approaching unhealthy levels in some places, stifling productivity growth, helping businesses delay the search for more sustainable solutions to labor shortages. So, again, Joe Biden has made this entire problem. And as we continue, we're going to talk about the fact that he never even took a call from his border chief for like three years. We'll get to that momentarily. First, one year ago, Hershey's announced that a man would be leading their Women's Day campaign. We all rolled our eyes. We thought we'd have to buy from yet another company that believes that men can be women. Well, we here at The Daily Wire had a different idea. In 24 hours, we launched Jeremy's Chocolate because you should be able to buy delicious chocolate from a company that shares your values. Now, Jeremy's Chocolate is turning one year old. Oh, our little baby is growing up. To celebrate, make sure that you get yourself some Jeremy's Chocolate. As you can see, we have some he, him with nuts. And then we have she, her without nuts. 
because that's both the way the chocolate works and also human biology. It also comes in microaggression size. Get yours at jeremyschocolate.com today. Okay, meanwhile, so the Biden administration is trying to make the claim that they actually are not at fault for what's going on at the border, but they have a rather large problem with that. That, of course, is that they are clearly responsible for what is happening at the border. So former Border Patrol Chief Raul Ortiz was on 60 Minutes. This is under Joe Biden. He was the Border Patrol Chief. He says he never talked to Joe Biden. Yeah, this might be the fault of the Biden administration. In our interview, Ortiz criticized Governor Abbott for not cooperating with the Border Patrol and playing politics with immigration. But he also expressed frustration with President Biden. I've never had one conversation with the president or the vice president, for that matter. And so I was the chief of the Border Patrol. I commanded 21,000 people. That's a problem. Yes, yes, it is. How much of a problem is this for the Biden administration? Well, the attack ads have not even started. This is going to be a super ugly election cycle. Everyone is. This one's going to be particularly ugly, especially because you can't get anybody to like your candidate. People who love Trump love Trump. Everybody else, me. People who love Biden don't exist. So that means that this election is going to be about tearing down the opposition, as it usually is. And this is a target-rich environment for the Trump campaign because Joe Biden, there are cer certainly on immigration, you can clearly identify victims of Joe Biden's immigration policy. One of those victims is Lakin Riley. Lakin Riley, of course, was murdered just last week at University of Georgia. And um, the response of the local mayor was to claim that this was the fault of Donald Trump. She was murdered on February 22nd, 2024. She was jogging and her body was found near a lake of a wooded area. Her death was caused by blunt force trauma. The person arrested was, of course, an illegal immigrant. Alejandro Mayorkas was asked directly about this. Look at the way that he deals with this. This is a disaster for the Biden administration. A 22-year-old nursing student, I know you've been following this, uh, Lake and Riley in the state of Georgia was murdered allegedly uh, by an undocumented Venezuelan migrant. The suspect had been detained by Porter Patrol upon crossing, released with temporary permission to stay in the country. He then went on allegedly to commit crimes uh, twice, once in New York for driving a scooter without a license and once in connection with a shoplifting case in Georgia. Did those states and their law enforcement communicate to the federal government that this had happened? Should this man have been deported? Um, a few thoughts. First, Margaret, first and foremost, an absolute tragedy. And our hearts break for and our prayers are with the family. Number one. Number two. And importantly, as a prosecutor, having prosecuted violent crime and other crimes for 12 years, one individual is responsible for the murder, mm -hmm. and that is the murderer. And we work very closely with state and local law enforcement to ensure that individuals who pose a threat to public safety are indeed our highest priority for detention and removal. Okay, there's only one problem with that, which, of course, it's not true. Not true. The person shouldn't have been in the country in the first place. Sanctuary city policies all over the United States have allowed career criminals to stay in play. This administration has been incredibly soft on crime. And so they've got a real problem on their hands. America also suggested that executive orders aren't going to solve anything, which, of course, is not true because it is Joe Biden's executive orders upon coming into office that opened up the border wide. Given that CNN is reporting last week uh, that the administration is considering executive action, that would block migrants claiming asylum if they illegally cross into the United States. Can you tell us exactly what's on the table? Dana, we um, consider options at all times. That's the responsibility of good government. But an administrative action is no substitute for an enduring solution. When we take administrative actions, as we have done a number of times, we are challenged in court. Legislation is the enduring solution. And by the way, we cannot, through administrative action, plus up the United States Border Patrol, Customs and Border Protection, by 1,500 personnel like this legislation proposes. We cannot, through administrative action, add 4,300 asylum officers so that we can work through the backlog and turn the system into an efficient and well-working one, which it hasn't been for more than three decades. Um, well, you know what you could do? You could put back in place Donald Trump's Remain in Mexico policy in which everybody who applies for asylum has to not 
be entered into the United States and they remain in Mexico to await their asylum determination, which would stop the vast onslaught on the border. And then you could also redefine the interpretation of asylum law such that you actually have to show that you deserve asylum to be let into the country, not merely say things like, I fear to go back to my home country. That is not enough. And meanwhile, but the Democrats won't let go of this. They won't let go of this. Again, they've been captured by the radical base. And so the, the smart move here, of course, would be to moderate on the border and they won't do it. So Chris Murphy, who's a member of the wild left Connecticut senator who makes his appearance on the Sunday shows pretty much every every week, he says that we cannot change sanctuary city policies, which, of course, is a lie. Of course, you can change sanctuary city policies. And of course, you should. It turns out that people go to sanctuary cities to receive the benefits and magic of the sanctuary city. He's like, well, that's not a magnet. Of course it is. If I put up a sign in my donut store saying free donuts for everyone, I'm going to be out of donuts pretty damned quickly. Here's Chris Murphy. We saw New York Mayor Adams uh, call for drastic changes to New York City's sanctuary policies. As, as the whole sanctuary city movement, did it, did it go too far? Are we seeing a rollback of that? Should there be a rollback of that? Well, you know, we treat immigrants compassionately in Connecticut as well. Um, and listen, I think that speaks to the best of this country. Ultimately, this solution has to be on the border and in the countries that people are fleeing. Um, I don't think it's in the best interest of this country to push immigrants into the shadows once they are here. So to me, the focus has to be on the border. The focus has to be on the border, but they won't do anything at the border, which is why Donald Trump is winning the border issue by 20 to 30 points in the polling data. Here's Donald Trump over the weekend going after Joe Biden. This message is going to tell. It is going to continue to do body damage to the Biden campaign. Every day, Joe Biden is giving aid and comfort to the foreign enemies of the United States. He's actually giving aid. And they don't respect us anymore as a country. Three years ago, we were more respected than ever before. And now they have no respect for us whatsoever. And Putin yesterday is talking about nuclear. Did you hear that, right? Nuclear. He wouldn't be talking about nuclear if I were here. He wouldn't be talking about it. By the way, again, dirty little secret here is Donald Trump is outflaking Joe Biden on the right with regard to Vladimir Putin. The bottom line here is that Joe Biden is in serious trouble. And he keeps he is operating on a completely false theory here. His theory, it is belied by every piece of poll data, is that the biggest problem he has is base turnout. That is not correct. The biggest problem that he has is that independents and moderates are abandoning him in droves. You want to take a look? And how we know this? John Fetterman, for example, is the senator in Pennsylvania. John Fetterman's approval rating is 13 points above water. He's a very popular senator from Pennsylvania. He has taken the most pro-Israel position of pretty much anybody in the United States Senate. Joe Biden is underwater in Pennsylvania. He could easily lose the state. He's running at best dead even with Donald Trump in the state of Pennsylvania. It turns out that Americans don't really like it very much when, say, you appease terrorists. Your base may, but it turns out that most Americans, including independents, do not. Okay, so the Biden administration continues to send all the wrong signals in the Middle East again in an attempt desperately to win Dearborn, Michigan, and it ain't going to help. There are not enough votes in Dearborn, Michigan to make up for the fact that he's losing the white working class in states like Michigan. It's why Joe Biden is in trouble. But again, the Democrats have been totally captured by the editorial board of the New York Times. The editorial board of the New York Times got captured by the woke interns, and then they in turn have captured the Biden administration, who seems to believe that if they just repeat January 6th on, on broader and louder volume, then magically they're going to win this election. And so they are just catering to the Hamasniks in Dearborn, Michigan. So over the weekend, for example, Kamala Harris, the vice president of the United States, suggested there needed to be an immediate ceasefire in Gaza. Now, the White House immediately tried to walk this back a little bit. They tried to say, well, what she means that Hamas should agree to a ceasefire because it turns out awkwardly over the weekend, Israel agreed to many of the preconditions for a ceasefire and Hamas turned it down. The reason Hamas turned down a ceasefire is because they believe that the West is going to force Israel to stop without Hamas giving up hostages, without Hamas going into exile, with Hamas retaining control in the Gaza Strip, with the possibility that Hamas even gains control of the West Bank. Hamas may not be wrong considering the pathetic leftism of our current crop of Western leadership. But here is Kamala Harris making a fool of herself on this issue just yesterday. And given the immense scale of suffering in Gaza, there must be an immediate ceasefire. For at least the next six weeks. And then everybody starts. What is those are the crazy right there. The the crazies. <laughs> this will get the hostages out. Listen to the crazies. And get a significant amount of aid in. Okay, there's only one problem. Hamas rejected that deal. 
So what is she actually saying? So the White House tried to say that what she was saying was Hamas needs to accept the ceasefire. But you can hear the crowd. They don't think that's what Kamala Harris means. And Hamas knows that the more this administration does PR for a ceasefire, the more it helps Hamas. They know this. Chris Murphy, the dullard from Connecticut, he's doing the same thing. Here he was suggesting that Biden has to use all his leverage to get to a long-term ceasefire. Leverage on whom? On whom? I mean, it can't be leverage on Hamas because Hamas leverage doesn't apply. Israel's bombing them forward into the Stone Age and killing all their members. And they're still not giving up power. So what exactly would the leverage be other than presumably some sort of carrot from the Israelis that leaves Hamas in power? What exactly is he advocating here? The, the magic of, of idiotic diplomacy is that it lies in vagary. That's the magic of idiotic. If you just say words like ceasefire, then magically they manifest. It's like Harry Potter. If you say the right spell, you know, ceasefire bedairo. if you say that sort of stuff, then magically peace breaks out. It's nonsense. Here's Chris Murphy making a fool of himself as per our usual arrangement. Okay, I, I want to turn to what we saw in Michigan, where over 100,000 Democrats went to the polls and voted non-committed. Uh, obviously a, a protest vote to the president's handling of the situation in Gaza. How, how concerned as a political matter uh, should, should Democrats be? I, I don't think we should be concerned about this as a political matter because this is such a critical issue relative to America's national security and the security of the Middle East. I would hope that the president doesn't make decisions about what to do in Gaza or the Middle East based upon how the votes line up. Listen, I think it is time for the president to use all the leverage that he has um, to get a long-term ceasefire. I think if that ceasefire doesn't come, it's in Israel's interest for them to pause military activity to solve the humanitarian crisis. But to the extent the president is using additional leverage on Israel, he should do that for national security reasons, not for political reasons. These issues are too important to be dictated by the polls. Except that they are being dictated by the polls. Yeah, because, again, Joe Biden caved rhetorically on a lot of this stuff. The Democratic Party then pushed way to the left, and now he is following, as he always does, the center of the Democratic Party. According to this brand new Wall Street Journal poll, 16% of Republicans only say that Israel has gone too far in responding to Hamas. 70% of Democrats do. 70%. 40% of Democrats under the age of 40 said the United States was doing too much to help Israelis, compared with 33% of Democrats aged 40 and older. The same poll shows, by the way, that overall 57% of the American people believe that the United States is giving about the right amount or too little support to the Israelis. Only 30% think that too much support is being given to the Israelis. And that overall, some 43% of Americans believe that Israel has either been about right or not gone far enough. So a plurality actually believe the opposite. But Democrats are on the wrong side of the American public on this, and they are attempting to flip the American public on this, even as Hamas exacerbates the problem. Hamas is stealing aid. So they have the help of the media, Hamas, because the media and Hamas work hand in glove. In fact, when it comes to the coverage of the Gaza Strip, Hamas and the media are one and the same. Many members of the media are Hamas fellow travelers working hand in glove with Hamas. And so we've heard this vast bevy of stories recently about human rights abuses with regard to the, the provision of aid in the Gaza Strip. The big problem is there is no one to provide the aid in the Gaza Strip because Hamas won't surrender. Hamas is hijacking the aid. The people aren't getting the aid, which means that Israel has to hire third-party drivers, or Egypt and Qatar do, those third-party drivers are very often being hijacked, harmed by members of the Hamas contingent, as well as the Gazan population. The Israelis have hundreds of trucks stacked up at the border, and there is no one to take them in. There is no one who is willing to drive them in and distribute the aid because it's a bleep show over there because Hamas won't surrender. By the way, again, all of this ends the minute that Hamas surrenders. This is being pointed out by the spokesperson, for the IDF, Elon Levy, here he was. As for the specific question of humanitarian aid, we want to see as much humanitarian aid get into Gaza to the people who need it while making sure that Hamas cannot steal it. Now, that's why we've done, on the one hand, expanded capacity at the Israeli crossings. There is now more than double the excess capacity at Israel's crossings to get more aid in. As we speak right now, there are 300 trucks worth of humanitarian aid sitting on the Gazan side of the Kerem Shalom crossing, waiting for the UN to pick it up and distribute it. The aid is getting in. The problem is that the UN is struggling to distribute that aid at the pace that Israel is facilitating its entry into Gaza. All of that is true. But because there's no one to actually distribute the aid, the bottom line is that the West, the United States, places that are in the Arab world are working with the Israeli government to airdrop aid into the middle. 
That is not because Israel won't distribute the aid. It's because there is no one to distribute the aid because Hamas will not surrender and they are trying to kill people and hijack the aid. Meanwhile, the media are blaming Israel for all of that. At the same exact time all this is happening, the Houthis actually sank another ship. This is the first ship that the Houthis have successfully sunk at this point. According to the Washington Post, a cargo ship sank in the Red Sea after an attack by Houthi militants, taking about 21,000 metric tons of fertilizer down with it, posing a significant environmental risk to one of the world's busiest waterways in the home of many coral reefs. The Ruby Mar was struck by an anti-ballistic missile fired by the Houthis on February 18th. It sank early on Saturday after slowly taking on water since the attack. It will cause an environmental disaster, apparently. The Houthi attack last month caused an 18-mile oil slick and forced the crew to abandon the ship. Again, the West has, has been unable to curb the lashings out of a primitive terrorist group. A terrorist group that, again, the Biden administration delisted as a terrorist group early on in their administration. Meanwhile, anti-Semitism all over the world continues to percolate. The Washington Free Beacon reports that when Israeli lawyer Ron Bart Yoshevat was speaking at University of California, Berkeley, his speech was canceled after violent protesters choked a female student attendee, spit in another attendee's face, broke into the auditorium where Bar Yoshevat waited on stage. The administration had no apology to offer. Meanwhile, over the course of the last week, there was a shooting of a Jewish doctor in San Diego by a Muslim disgruntled ex-patient. No motive has yet been offered in that particular shooting. An Orthodox Jewish man was stabbed in Switzerland by somebody shouting the usual and shouting anti-Semitic slogans. This sort of stuff continues. And yet the pressure on the Democratic side is for them to cave to Hamas. Is that going to make them more popular with the American people? Is caving, do the American people don't like Hamas very much. Do they really think that it's going to buy them a ton of goodwill and votes to pressure Israel into, into stopping early and leaving Hamas in place? Democrats also have another force coming down the, the railway tracks for them that's going to be very ugly. And that force is the backlash that is coming from these Trump lawsuits. So Letitia James, and she is the person who's been going after Donald Trump in New York. She literally came into office pledging to get Donald Trump, which is not exactly how law enforcement is supposed to work. Typically, you identify the crime and then you prosecute the criminal. You don't identify the person and then seek to uncover the crime. But Letitia James did the latter. And it turns out that most people I don't think are going to like the fact that she went after Donald Trump on a bunch of civil charges that are absolutely absurd. As the Wall Street Journal editorial page points out, because Letitia James could not demonstrate that banks relied on Trump's misrepresentation, she rested her case on a sweeping state civil fraud law known as Executive Law Section 6312. That's a, that statute substantially mirrors federal criminal fraud statutes. But typically, federal courts require proof of property loss or damage to prove fraud. She proved neither. So Judge Engeron, in that particular case, along with Letitia James, I've now fined him $400 million. Now James is tweeting out that Trump owes an additional $114,000 in interest to the state every day that he doesn't cough up the money. Is that going to make Trump less popular or more popular? Meanwhile, Fannie Willis and her ridiculous case against Donald Trump in Georgia. This RICO case that is a, a legal joke. Well, Fannie Willis, it turns out, again, was stooping the guy she hired to be one of her chief prosecutors and then moving money around in particularly corrupt ways. Is that case going to somehow redound against Trump? Here, for example, is a lawyer for one of the other defendants in Fannie Willis's prosecution on January 6th going after Fannie Willis and pointing out her corruption. The general rule on conflicts of interest for lawyers is in Rule of Professional Conduct 1.7. And we all know, it's all drummed into us, that we cannot have a conflict of interest. And if we do, we have to withdraw or we will be disqualified. The basic idea is that a conflict of interest impairs the lawyer's independent professional judgment. That's the test of a conflict and whether it can be waived and whether it's disqualifying. And th that conflict is not just financial. It can be any conflict that impairs your independent professional judgment. And you see that in McLaughlin v. Payne. There are six different actual conflicts of interest in this case, any one of which warrants disqualification, but collectively, practically compelling. First, the financial conflict that's already been covered. <clears throat> Second, the personal ambition, political ambition. There, third, there's a dovetailed or complementary pattern <clears throat> of deceit and concealment of the relationship and the money. Fourth, the speech at the church. Fifth, the motion for protective order that the DA filed <clears throat> in Mr. Wade's divorce case. 
Sixth, the way the state has conducted the defense of this motion to disqualify, especially the hearing. Okay, Fannie Willis, if she is not disqualified, it doesn't matter because the case is still not going to redound against Donald Trump. The Democrats and their attempt to get Donald Trump by throwing everything against the wall have made themselves look foolish. It is not going to hurt Donald Trump in the end. Donald Trump, for his part, he uh, he added his commentary on Fannie Willis. And again, like, this is funny. He worked with Fannie, even though it's spelled Fannie. F-A-N-I, Fannie. How about that one? How about that one with her lover? Nathan Wade, her lover. Let's go get Trump. Because if they go after Trump, he, they can pay him more money. And then she can take beautiful trips on the sea, beautiful trips to foreign islands. Her and her lover, they have such a good time. The guy got paid almost a million dollars and he never did it before. But he did the other thing before that he did with Fonnie. He did plenty of that. That's what he's good at, I guess. Yeah, well, the Fannie Willis case, I don't think that's going to turn down to Democrats' benefit. Already coming up, we'll get into some cultural commentary. So Sam Smith, who was once just a normal gay dude, has turned into a, a public freak show. If you're not a member, become a member. Use code Shapiro at checkout for two months free on all annual plans. Click that link in the description and join us.